Hello, and welcome back to Based, and happy fall. This is my favorite season, which you might have guessed since I am a white girl. We have college football, Roll Tide, by the way. You can buy literally anything you want in pumpkin spice flavor, which I just think is proof that capitalism is amazing. And we get fire pits. So life is good. In honor of fall, I have released an entire new merch line at my website, hannadecox.com. Head on over. You can get all kinds of good gear. There's based gear. I'm repping mine today. I actually love the quality of the store that we're using as our distributor. It's so soft, fits really nicely. It's great quality. I'm loving it. I'm waiting on like my long sleeve capitalism t-shirt to come in. I have a taxation is theft sweatshirt that's coming. It's going to be a great fall. Uh, we also have masks that say security theater. I, I don't know. I love my gear. I used to like spend my time in my room as a little kid, like drawing t-shirts. <laughs> and now I have a t-shirt line. So I'm just having the best time with it. Anyways, all proceeds go back to making based. So head on over, get some stuff. I love doing this show and I'm really hopeful down the road I can increase the number of episodes per month, but it does take me about 15 to 20 hours on average to research and write and produce each episode. So it is a lift. And next month will actually be one year since I launched. So it's been a really incredible journey. And I just want to say all of you have meant so much to me. I really appreciate you tuning in and, and your continued to, uh, support. So on that end, I usually do this towards the end of the episode. But if you want to help increase the audience for the show, there are a few things you could do that would really help me besides buy my merch and support me. More importantly, you can on YouTube subscribe to the channel. Hit the bell so you'll actually get notifications when new episodes come out and mark the channel as see first so YouTube actually puts it in your timeline. They really make you work to see the content that you want to see, guys. Um, plus, you can like, comment, and share the episode. That really boosts the algorithm. It's so helpful. So if you can take a few seconds to do that, I would appreciate it. And lastly, if you're on iTunes, you can leave a review and let others know you like the show. That's also super helpful unless you're going to say something mean about me and then just don't do that. So yeah, thanks in advance. All of those things really help us continue to get better visibility for the show. So with that said, we're going to jump into today's topic. I'm doing it. I'm going there. We're going to talk about immigration. It's a big episode. I'm still decently young, or at least I like to think I am. So maybe my memory isn't that long, but I never knew immigration was such a contentious subject until 2015. Like I was truly caught off guard by the wave of anti-immigration sentiment that hit during that campaign season. Did not see it coming. Uh, and I think a lot of that surprise came from the fact that after Mitt Romney's loss in 2012, the GOP explicitly stated its new goal would be better immigration policies and outreach in the next election. And then they just like went the total very opposite direction. It was weird. I was, I was confused. I'm, I'm still confused. But as I began to look back on the history of our public policy, I realized that immigration has always been sort of a hot potato politically. So I want to do a few things in this episode. First, I want to go back to the beginning of our immigration policy and examine how it has ebbed and flowed over our 250-ish years. Secondly, I want to examine many of the common assumptions around immigration, like do immigrants commit more crimes? Are they good for an economy? Are they destined to vote one way or another? Do they consume a lot of welfare? You know the question. So we're going to we're going to cover that. And lastly, I want to thoroughly explain the free market limited government stance on immigration. I'm going to make my case for my beliefs and kind of more fully explain them because I think they don't often really get the attention that they deserve. So let's go. Obviously, the United States was built by immigrants. We all know that. Seven of the 39 men who signed the Constitution were immigrants, including Alexander Hamilton. I had to. I love that show. Uh, when George Washington chose justices of the first Supreme Court, three of them were immigrants. Four of the six secretaries of the Treasury were immigrants. And of the 81 congressmen in the first Congress, eight were immigrants. Now, technically, everyone who comes here comes from immigrants, except for Native Americans. But by the time we won our independence from Britain, many of those Americans were already second generation. So this, what I'm referring to is people who were not born on U.S. soil. Anyways, lots of immigrants in our initial government. 
And you'll remember in our last episode, I discussed how the founding documents are actually pretty short. They literally have pocket constitutions. You can fit the charter of our nation into your pocket. It's that short. So while immigration is kind of sort of in there, it's really pretty open-ended. You have Article 1, Section 8 of the U.S. Constitution, which grants Congress the responsibility to establish a uniform rule of naturalization. Basically, Congress has the power to determine how immigrants can become citizens. Naturalization equals citizenship. That's what they have jurisdiction over. And basically, the way they carry that responsibility out is problematic from the start. The first Naturalization Act restricted naturalization to free white people. And so from the very beginning, there is this racial element to our immigration laws. In 1857, you have one of the worst Supreme Court decisions in our history, Dred Scott. That decision said a slave, Dred Scott, who lived in a free state, was not entitled to his freedom and that African-Americans were not and could never be citizens of the United States. In 1866, the 14th Amendment overturns Dred Scott, that's post-Civil War, and black people were able to become naturalized citizens from 1870 on. But don't think the, the racist immigration policy stops there. We're just getting started. In 1882, Chinese laborers were specifically excluded from the eligibility to immigrate. And this is just kind of the very early or origins of what was happening around immigration in our country. And the courts basically just let these things stand. And this is a pattern you will see repeated. The courts are really overly deferential to the federal government on immigration, despite the powers granted to the federal government under the U.S. Constitution in this area being very, very minimal. While all of this was happening federally in our early history, many states also enacted their own immigration rules. These were also aimed at preventing individuals with criminal records, people reliant on public assistance, slaves, and free black people from residing in certain states. And you're going to keep seeing this kind of racial element to our immigration policy present itself throughout our history. Really, rarely is immigration policy about mere numbers Typically, it's more about keeping certain groups of people out. Aside from the naturalization clause, the Constitution allows the immigrants who become naturalized citizens to serve in any government office except for one, which is the presidency, and it deals with expatriation or giving up one citizenship. It's pretty much the extent of it. Notably, while Congress is given the power to determine naturalization or citizenship, it really isn't given the power to restrict movement of people or actual migration. There are a few small exceptions under its authority to declare war, provide for the common defense, and define and punish offenses against international law. Congress can forbid the movement of enemy soldiers, spies, terrorists, and pirates, among others. But otherwise, the federal government really has drawn its immigration power not from the Constitution, but mostly from what is known as the plenary power doctrine. This doctrine traces its way back to the 1889 Supreme Court decision in Che Chan Ping, where the judges used the case to establish a legal precedent that said the federal government did possess the authority to regulate migration, even though such a power was not enumerated in the Constitution. So they literally made it up, as they be doing. They, the Supreme Court loves to make up, make up doctrines, man. That's their jam. Essentially, this doctrine holds that the political branches, the legislative and the executive, have sole power to regulate all aspects of immigration as a basic attribute of sovereignty. And that's basically how they've been getting away with sweeping immigration controls ever since. Um, it's worth noting that while the country began trying to regulate immigration almost immediately, though, and the courts kind of condoned it, it wasn't actually condoned by our founders. So they, you know, not only did they say this constitution says literally all that the federal government has power to do, nothing more. And they were like, well, did you really mean that? Um, but even afterwards, the founders kept speaking out like, no, no, we really meant that. So um, I kind of want to cover a little like side note here. Uh, in 1798, Congress passed four laws known collectively as the Alien and Sedition Acts. These laws raised the residency requirements for citizenship from five to 14 years and authorized the president to deport aliens and permitted their arrest, imprisonment, and deportation during wartime. In the Virginia Resolution against the Alien and Sedition Act, so the states were actually fighting back, uh, James Madison argued that the Alien Friends Act exercises a power nowhere delegated to the federal government. 
Similarly, in his October 1798 draft of the Kentucky Resolution against the Alien and Sedition Acts, Thomas Jefferson said, Alien friends are under the jurisdiction and protection of the laws of the state wherein they are, and that no power over them has been delegated to the U.S. nor prohibited to the individual states distinct from their power over citizens. So all of that to say, if you consider yourself to be a constitutionalist or even someone that really just adheres to the basic premises we were founded upon, an anti-immigration stance is off base with what you profess to believe. I'm sorry if I'm the first one to tell you. So now that we've covered the foundation, let's cover a few other milestones in our immigration public policy over the decades. Essentially, I think of this section of like how we screwed it all up. Despite some pretty obvious missteps, you know, in our immigration policy early on, namely racism, the the country remains relatively free and open to immigration during the 18th and early 19th centuries. We essentially had open borders until the 1920s. They'd throw some like age requirements around, maybe a literacy test, but it was quick, cheap, and seamless to move across our borders for most of our history and even to become a citizenship at large. Uh, Sorry, to become a citizen at large. And we had a ton of people come here during this era, the mid 1800s, which is when we first kind of started bothering to track this at all, to the early 1900s brought a tidal wave of immigrants. In 1850, 2.2 million immigrants came in one year, which was roughly 10% of the overall population at that time. It's a lot of people. Uh, Over these decades, we welcome 4.5 million Irish people, 2 million Jewish people, 5 million Germans, 4 million Italians, and 25,000 Chinese people went to California alone during the gold rush. According to the History Channel, though, the influx of newcomers resulted in anti-immigrant sentiment among certain factions of America's native-born, predominantly Anglo-Saxon, Protestant population. The new arrivals were often seen as unwanted competition for jobs, while many Catholics, especially the Irish, experienced discrimination for their religious beliefs. And so the winds really started to change in the latter 1800s as far as the public's sentiment towards immigration. In 1875, the Supreme Court declared immigration a federal responsibility in the case Chai Lung versus Freeman. They did this in response to a number of states that were increasingly setting their own policies following the Civil War. And of course, this decision led to a slew of new laws from Congress. They're like, oh, we have a responsibility. We got you. We've got plenty of laws. So they start passing a bunch of stuff. You have the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882 and the Alien Contractor Labor Laws of 1885 and 1887, which prohibited certain laborers from immigrating to the United States. Um, This was especially pushed for by Californians at the time who believed that the Chinese were taking the jibs. The General Immigration Act of 1882 levied a head tax of 50 cents on each immigrant and blocked or excluded the entry of idiots, lunatics, convicts, and persons likely to become a public charge. Like, listen, no more lunatics here because we have enough of our own. America is full. That cracks me up. Given all these new laws at the federal level, President Benjamin Harrison designated Ellis Island as a federal immigration station to process the newcomers and enforce regulations. More than 12 million immigrants entered the United States through Ellis Island during its years of operation from 1892 to 1954. And I want to note a few things here that I think will be important to know in contrast later in this episode. Uh, The first is that it was still extremely easy to immigrate to the U.S. during this time period, and unless your race was, of course, one of the ones being targeted. To get through Ellis Island took only a matter of hours. No papers were required because passports weren't even invented until the 1920s and really still shouldn't be something that we have to use. Passengers literally, they, they literally just like got off the ship, went through a health check and an interview, and then they got to go and build their lives. Like it was as simple as that. And most importantly, it didn't cost them significant money to go through this process. Uh, Again, we're not talking about small numbers here either. Like the fact that we were able, this actually amazes me. The peak year for admission of new immigrants during this time period was 1907, when approximately 1.3 million people entered the country legally. And yet they were able to process all of these people in a matter of hours without computers. Like, where, where did we lose that energy in the U.S.? My DMV can't process six people in like three hours. I, I would really like to look more into this because they had something going right here. 
Anyways, World War I uh, begins in 1914, and this causes immigration to begin to decline. And it also kicked off a less favorable era of immigration policy. In 1924, this is where things really kind of start to turn. We're open borders. Things are going great till then. The country's growing. We're becoming a world power. Uh, but we get the Immigration Act of 1924, which created a quota system. And this restricts entry to 2% of the total number of people of each nationality in America as of the 1890 National Census. And this was a system that favored immigrants from Western Europe and prohibited immigrants from Asia. Between 1929 and 1932, deportation sweeps and other raids resulted in the Mexican-born population in California, Arizona, New Mexico, and Texas dropping from 616,000 to 377,000. They cut it in half. And then you get World War II. Don't forget who is in office during this time period. You already know. My dead arch nemesis, FDR, who the more... <laughs> I look into the more I realize he was really just like the OG Trump. They are so similar. It blows my mind. Anyways, here's a couple of his major immigration moments. In his fireside chat of May 26, 1940, FDR basically insinuated that German and Italian Americans were probably Nazi sympathists and spies working for their homelands and encouraged Americans to be vigilant. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. That sounds so familiar to me. Uh, Americans who were always pretty eager to turn their neighbors in because we are a nation of Karens, called the FBI with over 2,900 reports of suspected sabotage in just one day that May. They were like, gotcha, we gotcha. Stranger danger over here. Like, they were on it. By June 1940, Congress had passed the Smith Act, which required aliens to register and be fingerprinted and gave the government the power to deport current or past members of fascist and communist organizations. After Pearl Harbor, more than 11,000 German Americans and 120,000 Japanese Americans were rounded up and placed in internment camps for the duration of the war. That's something they never teach you in U.S. history. The U.S. loves putting people in camps, and don't you ever forget it. From the mid-1940s to the mid-1940, I'm sorry, from mid-1940 to mid-1941, only 4,000 refugees entered the U.S., which was down from 40,000 in the prior year. The government also refused to grant visas to individuals who had relatives residing in German-occupied territory. And perhaps most importantly, the State Department and FDR claimed that Jewish immigrants could threaten national security. We blocked Jewish people from coming here as refugees during the Holocaust. I, I can't. I, I can only even. It blows my mind. In June of 1939, the German ocean liner St. Louis and its 937 refugee passengers, almost all Jewish, were turned away from the port of Miami, forcing the ship to return to Europe. More than a quarter of those people died in the Holocaust. Over the course of the war, thousands of other Jews were denied refuge in the U.S. All in all, during this time period, only 21,000 refugees were admitted from Axis-controlled nations, a paltry 10% of the mandated quotas. If the new restrictive policies had not gone into effect and the quotas had been met, an additional 190,000 people might have made it to safety. That actually gives me chills. Uh, moving forward from that bit of glum history, between 1930 and 1950, America's foreign-born population had decreased from 11.6 to 6.9% of the total population. And that's not good. Decreasing immigration is a sign of a dying country and a dying economy. So they started to make some changes because most people know this deep down. You, you want immigrants to want to come to your country. We need them. Uh, and so in 1942, I'm going to say this wrong. I always say it wrong. In 1942, we launched the Bracero program. I can't roll my R's. <laughs> So anytime, yeah, I just, I stumble. But this was a deal between the U.S. and Mexico to bring Mexican workers into work on short-term agricultural labor contracts. From 1942 to 1964, 4.6 million contracts were signed, making it the largest U.S. contract labor program to date. And it was a wonderful program in many ways. They had some issues, but as a whole, it had really some really cool effects too. After the war, Congress passed special legislation enabling refugees from Europe and the Soviet Union to enter the United States. In 1952, legislation allowed a limited number of visas for Asians, and race was finally formally removed as grounds for exclusion. 
Following the communist revolution in Cuba in 1959, hundreds of thousands of refugees from that island also gained admittance. And in 1965, we get the Immigration and Nationality Act, which did away with quotas based on nationality and allowed Americans to sponsor relatives from their countries of origin. This law meant our immigration policy began to focus on skills-based criteria as well. Uh, the Refugee Act of 1980 raised the annual ceiling for refugees from 17,400 to 50,000 and created a process for reviewing and adjusting the refugee ceiling to meet emergencies. In 1986, Congress enacted another major law, which was the Immigration Reform and Control Act, and that granted legalization to millions of unauthorized immigrants, mainly from Latin America, and it was signed by conservatives' favorite president, Reagan. That's right. Reagan did amnesty, and it went great. It was fantastic. Uh, the Provisions Act of 1990 raised the cap on immigration from 270,000 people annually to 675,000 and 700,000 for the first three years of the act's enactment. It also increased the per country immigrant visa cap to 25,600. So things are kind of on the uptick for immigrants for a while. And I think this more open stance is one reason our economy was booming in the 90s. But like so many other good things we had going for us then, it was pretty much all downhill from there. In 1996, Congress passed the Illegal Immigrant Reform and Immigrant Responsibility Act, mandating the hiring of more Border Patrol agents. Repercussions for entering the country illegally were increased, and a border fence was planned for San Diego. An automated employment verification pilot program was also created in the hopes of easing work, uh, workplace enforcement, and the act also allowed state police officers to enforce immigration laws. Thanks, Clinton. That's awesome. And then 9-11 hits, and it just drastically impacts the way the country feels about immigration. In the 90s and even in 2000, Congress had passed several bipartisan mini amnesty bills for certain subsets of the immigration pop population. But after 9-11, anything of the sort was dead on arrival. Bills failed to gain support in 2005, 2006, and 2007. In 2003, ICE is formed, which is the federal law enforcement agency under the U.S. Department of Homeland Security, which we covered in our last episode. You know they're, not, they're no good, so go back and listen if you haven't. Um, and ICE is tasked with policing immigration. And that agency just really kicks the persecution and abuse of immigrants into high gear. I don't go into it here, but you can look into all the FOIAs and complaints that have been filed. It's pretty gruesome. Uh, shortly after this, Congress started using its annual appropriations, get this, to require that the detention centers remain full and even mandated an additional 8,000 detention beds. Gee, that, that sounds an awful lot like the private prison scam that fueled mass incarceration. Uh, no, literally, it, it is the exact same. Because public fury against private prisons led to most states getting rid of them. There's only about 8% of the prison population that are still in private prisons to this day. So what did they do with all those empty warehouses, camps for people? Well, they just shifted them to immigration detention centers instead, of course. Five private companies, Geo Group, Core Civic, LaSalle Corrections, Management and Training Corp., and Immigration Centers of America own and operate the largest ICE detention centers in the country. Yep. Beginning in 2010, the U.S. experiences a steep decline in undocumented people coming into the country, like no joke, uh, especially across the Mexican border. Like, they got the message, Okay not messing with those people. And this isn't a good thing for us, but I'll get into that to the economics of it later. But I do want to say that the media and politicians who work overtime to convince you there's a current crisis at our border are hacks. They're hacks. You're being played. I put data links in my show notes if you don't want to take my word for it. And you shouldn't. Read for yourself. I want you to research for yourself. But border crossings are way down since early 2000s when all this began and have been have been down. Like, it's, it's not a thing. You maybe have a couple waves of people, but like it is, <laughs> yeah. Anyways, that's there's a whole lot of fear mongering that goes into that. Anyways, next up we get Obama, who comes into office in 2010, promising change. And among the change, he promises immigration reform. He's so hopeful, and yeah. By 2012, though, he manages to enact protections for dreamers who are immigrants that came here with their legal parents as children, but who are still in line for their own status, but he was only able to do this via executive order and not through Congress. So that means it's a pretty flimsy um, action that he's able to get through. Like literally the next person can overturn it. 
2013, the infamously failed Gang of Eight forms, which was a bipartisan group of senators determined to pass a pathway to citizenship for the 11 million undocumented individuals in the U.S., but they were unsuccessful. Now, here's what you actually need to know about Obama. He's a great liar. Really. Oh, my gosh. Like, when I watch Obama, I'm like, I get sucked in. I'm like, why do I like him so much? I know I don't, but I can't resist him, you know? So he talked a big game on immigration reform, but the man actually carried out one of the most punitive immigration administrations in recent memory. And the general public knew pretty much nothing about it throughout his entire tenure because the mainstream media only does their jobs when a Republican's in office. Like, I'm not mad at the scrutiny Trump got. I want that energy everywhere in government. I want the media to go do their jobs. But we didn't get it uh, for a long time about Obama. Quietly, uh, he deported more people than any other president before or after him. More than Trump. That's right. The average daily count of immigrants in detention under him was about 33,000 compared to 19,000 under Bush and 5,000 under Clinton. Most of these people were Latino. Uh, he built the border cages that people later became outraged at Trump over. And he also separated kids from their families at the border. So not great. Not great. But then we get Trump, who just blows it out of the water. You know, in his opening campaign speech, he insinuates that the majority of Mexican immigrants are rapists and criminals. He promises to build a border wall and make Mexico pay for it. He says he's going to deport all illegal aliens. He's going to defund sanctuary cities, ban Muslims from entering the U.S., limit legal immigration, and triple the number of ICE agents. He largely won, not in spite of this platform, but because of it. And this is what kind of like shattered my world and finally pushed me away from the GOP, where I was like, what is happening? Like, just did not know that sentiment was there. Um, now, Trump's talking points were a lot harsher than the policy he was actually able to get through, but he did do a lot of damage, most importantly through stirring up xenophobia and anti-immigrant sentiment in the culture, which maybe had been dormant there for some time in a certain subset, but certainly wasn't radicalized or animated on the issue until him, at least not in my experience. And, and I grew up on the right. Like, I would have, I feel like I would have seen this. I would have heard people talk in this way. It really wasn't there, um, at least not out in the open, so... Anyways, uh, in 2017, Trump signed several executive orders. The most famous was a travel ban that restricted admission of citizens from Libya, Iran, Somalia, Syria, Yemen, North Korea, and Venezuela. This banned over 135 million potential immigrants and non-immigrant visitors. And it was called the Muslim ban because he was not legally able to ban people on the basis of their race anymore. So he used the countries of origin instead. But, like, we knew what he was doing. And this stood up in the Supreme Court. Um, he, he, got, he got this through. Trump also rescinded the Obama executive orders for DREAMers, like I predicted three minutes ago that somebody could, uh, making the potential recipients eligible for deport deportation again. ICE added at least 24 immigration detention centers and more than 17,000 beds under his presidency. USA Today found record profits for private detention centers during this time and record donations to Republican candidates, including Trump, from the private detention centers. Just one big crony family. We spent $3 billion a year, $3 billion a year, to warehouse roughly 50,000 people during this time compared to Obama's 30,000. That's an annual number. An investigation found more than 400 allegations of sexual assault or abuse, inadequate medical care, regular hunger strikes, frequent use of solitary confinement, more than 800 instances of physical force against detainees, nearly 20,000 grievances filed by detainees, and at least 29 fatalities, including seven suicides under Trump's tenure. What a legacy. Trump also expanded the child separation policy at the border, where children were regularly held past the government's own 72-hour separation rule. The federal government carried out almost 40,000 detentions of children who came with their families in 2014. Under Trump, that shot up to almost 250,000. Trump replaced roughly 200 miles of existing border fencing over four years, but erected only a few miles of new border wall. Uh, he also significantly reduced the number of refugees accepted each year, stalled green card applications, and reduced work visas. The number of refugees admitted in fiscal year 2020 was the lowest since this passage of the 1980 law that established current refugee procedures. And while that partly reflected the impact of the pandemic, uh, the fiscal 2018 and 2019 numbers were historically low, too. All in all, Trump was wildly successful in reducing legal immigration, but he actually didn't reduce illegal immigration at all. At all. 
According to the Cato Institute, in 2020, the removal of illegal immigrants from the interior of the United States was the lowest as an absolute number and as a share of the illegal immigration population since ICE was created in 2003. Trump failed to increase removals because local jurisdictions refused to cooperate with his administration. Yeah. Continuing a trend begun during the Obama administration in response to their deportation efforts. As a result, the population of illegal immigrants remained about the same as when he took office. I love, I love when people fight back against the federal government. It just sparks joy for me. Uh, and that brings us up to the present time. A few notable things under the uh, Biden administration thus far. When Biden took office, his administration ordered a 100-day pause on the deportation of people with final orders of removal. However, that pause didn't apply to people who posed a threat to national security, who were convicted of a felony, or who were incarcerated at the time of the memo. And a federal judge blocked it anyways. Secondly, Biden also started allowing some asylum seekers back into the country. That rule change is expected to affect about 25,000 asylum cases. Out of the roughly 96,000 migrants encountered by Border Patrol in February, more than 70,000 were turned away because of a federal pandemic rule that allows people to be turned away due to a pandemic health emergency. Biden lifted Trump's ban on catch and release, which is a vastly misunderstood policy. Uh, it specifically only allows asylum seekers to remain in the U.S. while awaiting their court dates to see if their petition is accepted. OK, it's not about catch and releasing criminals like, oh, my gosh. Uh, as a whole, though, we still have thousands of people in camps at our border. Thousands of Haitians were just deported. And it's estimated tens of thousands of others have also been removed during his first nine months in office. One of the most common excuses I hear for people um, or from people who support really draconian immigration policies is that they support legal immigration, just not illegal immigration, which if that's the case, I still don't know why they supported Trump because he was doing the opposite, <laughs> stomping out legal immigration and doing nothing about anti-illegal uh, immigration. Anyways, I, I don't really believe those people. I have to be honest. I, I think they're either lying or, or that they're just really uneducated on the topic that they're voting on, which either way is not a good look because legal immigration in this country is becoming more of, more of a farce every day. There are, in fact, very few paths to citizenship here and barely any more paths to legal status for those who simply want to work, eat, or escape war, famine, or natural disasters. This system, this system is so complicated. You have no idea. I don't even have, I mean, I have a fraction of idea. In order to really speak on this, it would have to be my full-time job. It is virtually impossible to navigate without a highly specialized immigration attorney. It's so hard and complicated and expensive to come here now that I'm genuinely in awe of the people who manage it when they aren't even from here or when English isn't even their first language. Like, oh, holy cow. Like, it's impressive. Um, and while I can in no way encapsulate the breadth and trickiness of this system, I do want to give you some highlights. And for the love of God, I hope this at least helps you understand how ridiculous it is to say that you want people to come here legally. Like, so do they. So do they. They would love to come here legally. Are you serious? Like, if people really want to promote legal immigration, if that's really what they care about and they just they care about the paperwork so much, if that were true, those people should be working overtime to try to make it easier for people to come here legally because nobody wants to come here illegally. Immigrants would gladly go through a streamlined system if we had one. And then we'd free up billions of dollars we currently use to chase innocent people around over paperwork and put them in camps to focus on the few actual bad guys who do try to come here. Like, I, I feel like I'm the only person with common sense on this policy subject sometimes. Like, if you're worried about crime and terrorists, like, w they're more likely to get through because we're wasting money warehousing these children. How does that make sense? It doesn't. Anyways, let's look at how you can come here legally, right? I want, I want people to really know. If you don't know any immigrants, here's, here's, here are their options. Uh, one of the few ways to come legally, permanently, is through a green card. To be eligible for this, one must have family members in the U.S., a job, which usually you have to um, first have a work visa to obtain, and that's a whole other process, or you have to be in a protected class like refugees or asylum seekers, which we are consistently not really taking. Uh, aspiring immigrants in the backlog today for a green card might have to wait more than 50 years to have their application reviewed. 50 years. The wait list is currently 4 million people long. 
So those dreamers we mentioned who came here legally with their parents and they're just waiting on their status, like no help is coming for them. That's why we need a pathway for them. Uh, even before the fees for a lawyer, the fees for a green card cost thousands of dollars if you get that chance. So what options are left while you wait for your green card if you're even eligible for one? Well, there's the lottery. Seriously, we do this like Hunger Games kind of style thing where up to 50,000 immigrant visas are chosen by a computer each year. <laughs> yeah. Um, you can come here short term on things like student or tourist visas. If you have the right combination of skills, education, or work experience, you may be able to live and work permanently in the United States by seeking an employment-based visa, aka, do you know STEM? Uh, but those are still capped at 140000 per year. You can get, this is a good option, more, more immigrants should do this. You can get legal status if you have invested or are actively in the process of investing at least $1 million in a new commercial enterprise in the U.S., which will create Full-time positions for at least 10 qualifying employees. That's a, yeah, that's a great one. I don't know why they don't do that more. You can say if we give you an asylum or refugee status, but again, fat chance. And here's the real catch. Here's the real catch. In order to even apply for citizenship, you have to have been able to access one of these categories of legal permanent residence and lived in the U.S. legally for five years. You see the catch-22, right? Do you see it? You also, um, if, you get, if you get this far, uh, you also have to prove you know English, U.S. history, and government, and take an oath to the Constitution, which I'm fine with that part. That's pretty much the only thing I'm fine with in this entire scenario. Again, the government fees for these processes are in the thousands of dollars, and that's before attorney fees, which are also thousands and thousands of dollars. I tried to find like an average all-in number that people pay to go through this naturalization process, and I really wasn't able to. But I will say anecdotally, I know several people have immigrated here. I've never met anybody who got through it for less than $15,000 out of pocket. Do you have $15,000? Because the average American has something like $1,000 or less in their savings. And we live in the wealthiest country in the world in the world. But these people need to get through all this and have thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars. So anyways, now you know the history, you know the system. So I want to move out of politics, move into economics and theory. And I really want to kind of dig into the meat. So I think a lot of people are unaware that immigration is an economics issue. Most see it as a human rights issue or social policy. And it does, it does bridge those gaps, I suppose. But I want to show you how this is actually a capitalist versus anti-capitalist debate. Plain and simple. Let's go back to my man crush, Adam Smith. Love him. If you haven't watched or listened to my episode on capitalism, I covered him extensively there. But to recap, Smith is known as the father of the free market, and he had a lot of influence over our founding. He wrote The Wealth of Nations, which is basically the capitalist Bible in 1776. And Smith set forth two linked and indispensable conditions to be met if the economic system he described were to work. There must be free movement for all in the system so that each man might seek the best opportunity for his labor or resources. And there must be free competition among all for the buyer shilling, for markets, for labor, and for jobs. To put it more simply, free markets require free movement. It is a supply and demand issue the same as any other good or service. When the government limits the amount of migration, it leads to shortages, price spikes, and unfilled jobs. In short, it makes everything more expensive and less efficient. And many people, I think many people know how damaging high unemployment um, can be to an economy, but I think fewer people understand that a position of filled employment is also very detrimental for an economy. When you have more open jobs than you have people to fill, you will again see shortages and increase in production costs and therefore an increase in prices. Everybody's cost of living goes up. We're experiencing that right now where U.S. employers are unable to fill millions of jobs. Inflation is through the roof and it's only going to get worse and shortages are everywhere. You, you need to be aware of this. Uh, due to inflation alone, you've taken a 5.4% pay deduction this year and I'm betting you didn't even quite know that. If you were to get rid of all the undocumented immigrants in the country right now, the majority of people would not be able to pay their bills. Inflation would skyrocket. The price of basic bills like groceries would be unobtainable. And many of the people who argue um, against these immigrants, they're arguing against their own economic well-being without even knowing it. Like, I can afford to pay $50 more a week at the grocery store, but I'm really betting a lot of these people cannot. 
It, it would be so detrimental. They do not understand the economic policy that they're pushing for. And the idea, I think there's this fake idea, right? That the U.S. companies would just pay so much more for your job if these people left. And that's bogus. They wouldn't. The globalized world is here and it's not going away. They would merely take their companies overseas to find cheaper labor and take that positive economic input with them. This is a recipe for disaster in our economy. And it's fueled by delusions that we're somehow going to push our economy back to the 1950s. We're not. We're not. We're in the real world. That ship has sailed. Let's base our public policy on reality, please. Um, to add to this, America's birth rate is in steep decline. It fell another 4% last year, reaching yet another record low. We are currently not even at replacement levels right now. We need immigrants. If you want your Medicare when you retire, sir, like I promise you, you need the immigrants to come here. Like, I again, like I just don't think people truly understand what they're arguing for here. If you want an example of what we would look like if we were to continue down our anti-immigrant pathway, look at Japan. Their birth rate has also collapsed and they have very strict immigration and their economy is dying. Their civilization is dying. I listened to a podcast about one town where there's only like 12 people less. So they made these like weird, creepy dolls and placed them all around the town so they don't feel so lonely. Ah, like sounds like a horror movie. It's not good. It's a good thing when people want to come to your country because immigrants are always, 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 promise you, bet, always a net positive for an economy. All, always. Like this, this is a consistent data analysis. Uh, there's a, and there's a lot of reasons for it. Immigrants are typically attracted to growing regions and they increase the supply and demand sides of the economy once they are there, expanding employment opportunities. Um, the impacts on American wages that they have are confined to the lower single digits. Immigrants may increase the relative wages for some by a tiny amount and decrease them by a large amount for a few um, who directly compete against them. But as a whole, immigrants are far more likely to compete most directly against other immigrants. So the effects on less skilled native born Americans would still be very small or maybe even positive. Uh, immigrants also create jobs. They pay taxes and they stimulate an economy with their purchases. There is literally, there's literally no reason economically that people should not want immigrants to come here on principle or in practice. It's, it, it's not backed up by actual facts. Capitalism works really, really well when we let it. Um, I would also argue on top of that, that free movement is a natural born right that the founders unfortunately did not go far enough in protecting in the Bill of Rights. If I am unable to physically leave places where I am unsafe or unable to secure my basic needs, then I am not free at all. To me, this was especially pertinent during COVID. I thought about this a lot during COVID. Um, I'm not someone who will likely ever live through war or famine or things like ISIS, but I did live through COVID at the very beginning in New York City, where I knew like two people because I had just moved there. And free movement mattered so much to me in that moment. We, we could not get basic resources those first few weeks. There were no masks. Um, there were no moving trucks to get out. There was no toilet paper. The city was emptying. There was a body truck across the street from my apartment. You couldn't get a hospital bed if you needed it. And they couldn't get you to a morgue quick enough. So if you did die in one of the hospitals, your body got put on a truck. It was horrifying. Um, and they kept talking at that time about shutting the borders down. Cuomo and Trump, like they kept talking about shutting down the borders. And so I kept a flight booked every day of the week just in case an order came down and I needed to get out before it went into effect. I did ultimately leave and go back to South Carolina after two months um, to safety at my parents' house and to be with my family. And I just thought how terrible and scary and sad it would have been had I not been able to do that. Like imagine, I just, <laughs> imagine thinking it's okay to deny that right to people whose lives are in actual danger. And often in real danger because of our terrible foreign policy decisions. I, I can't, I actually can't fathom. I just can't put myself in that position. I truly don't understand. Uh, not only is an anti-immigration stance bad economically and bad on civil liberties, it truly is anti-capitalist. When you deny a business the right to hire the best person for the job at the best price they can find, that is a direct and consequential government intervention into the free market. These policies violate the rights of business owners and take us further away from a free market system and they violate the rights of individuals. They're just, they're just bad. America flourished for many years because of our diversity and our open door policy for immigrants. On the Statue of Liberty 
are ingrained some of the most beautiful words in American history. It says, give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. I want them. I want the underdogs, the overcomers, the scrappy people, the people resilience, the people whose dream it is to merely come here and work really hard and pull themselves up by their bootstraps. Those are the people that make America great. And our current decline, I think, is in large part thanks to the fact that we forgot it and we turned our backs on them. Those people are my countrymen as much as anybody else. Those people share my values and they're the ones that should get to come here And if they did, they would work like hell to prevent socialism and endless war from continuing to creep into our policies because they've lived through it and escaped it. These people make amazing allies. Um, Okay, one more thing before I get to my case for immigration policy. I want to quickly refute some of the anti-immigrant claims and assumptions I hear out there. Uh, A lot of people will say that they don't want immigrants to come here until we get rid of the welfare state, which they know good and damn well is nowhere close to happening. I'd like to think this argument is made in good faith, but I don't really think it is. Uh, Either way, it's really not that big of a factor when it comes to immigrants. Most legal immigrants do not have access to means-tested welfare for the first five years, um, with few exceptions that are mostly determined on the state level and funded with state taxes, which they would pay if they were working here. That's despite the fact that they pay into the system every bit as much as you or I do. Illegal immigrants don't have access at all except for emergency Medicaid. Immigrants are less likely to use means-tested welfare benefits than similar-born native-born Americans. When they do use welfare, the dollar value of benefits consumed is smaller, and immigrants in the United States have about a net zero impact on government budgets. So check that one off. The next wildly untrue myth around immigrants is that they commit a lot of crime. This myth has been repeated about every single race that has been disfavored by U.S. public policy throughout our history, whether it was black people, Chinese people, Italians, now Mexicans, and it's never true. Uh, Immigrants are actually less likely to be incarcerated for violent and property crimes, and cities with more immigrants and their descendants tend to be more peaceful. Some immigrants do commit violent and property crimes, of course, but overall, they are less likely to do so than U.S.-born individuals. Uh, The annual chance of being murdered in a terrorist attack committed by a foreigner from 1975 through the end of 2015 was about 1 in 3.6 million per year. Almost 99% of the people murdered by foreign-born terrorists on U.S. soil were murdered on 9-11, and the attackers entered on tourist visas and one student visa, not immigrant visas. From 2002 to Uh, through 2016, only one radicalized terrorist entered the United States for every 29 million visa or status approvals. Only one of the post-9-11 vetting failures resulted in an attack on U.S. soil, meaning that a single deadly terrorist entered as a result of a vetting failure for every 379 million visas or status approvals from 2002 through 2016. That is a phenomenally low risk. I think, I mean, I'm not great at math, but I'm pretty sure you are more likely to be eaten by two sharks than than for this to happen. Uh, Another frequent concern I hear is that immigrants are being imported by the Democrat party. Like what, which, by which leader, like they're, they're deporting them and putting them in camps too. But that's like the right wing talking point, right? Like the Democrats want them because they'll sway elections. Like, I don't know that they really do want them. But um, this one annoys me because if the GOP did even the slightest outreach at all, like literally to just say hello and take them like a banana bread, like, oh, my God. Or if the party actually stood for capitalism and limited government individual liberty like they say they do, these people would be theirs for the taking. They're mostly fleeing socialism and authoritarian regimes like It is your own fault if they don't vote for your party. Like, that is on you. That is straight up on you. And and on top of that, despite the GOP's best efforts to be utterly unattractive, their narrative is not even true. Many immigrants do consistently vote Republican, especially in places like Texas and Florida, and data shows their voting has a lot to do with the basic talking points that are used towards them and about them in in an election. Like, just be nice. Honestly. So anyways, for time's sake, I'll leave it there. Those are the top three bad arguments I hear about immigrants. Um, I think they're the most common, but I linked a longer document with lots of other studies, including the ones I just referred to. Um, and it actually covers many other typical arguments and refutes them if you're interested in that. Whew. This was a long outline. <laughs> We're in the home stretch. 
Lastly, let's touch on what I think immigration policy should look like based on a free market, limited government, individual liberty, pro-life, constitutionalist worldview. I believe in open borders. And I want to clarify what that means. Because every time it comes up, there are countless people in my comments that clearly do not know the difference in open borders and no borders. And that's fine, because I don't think we've done a good enough job of really explaining. Open borders really just means returning to the way that immigration was handled in this country up until the 1950s, Ellis Island style, but, you know, without the random racism, okay? Like, let's not do that again. And it's kind of odd to me that considering how long this policy was in play, that so many people see this as like a wild idea these days when it, it literally was how we did things for the majority of our history. And it worked really, really well. We became a superpower under these policies. We didn't waste billions of dollars a year tracking people down over imaginary lines and paperwork or lock people in cages. Personally, I think what we're doing right now is what is what's fringe and crazy. I think it, it's a crazy public policy. Um, benefits of open borders, as I mentioned before, if we reduce the pool of people uh, we're currently policing for no freaking reason, we'd have a much better shot of focusing our resources on actually preventing violence and solving crime, which we we are just very, very bad at in this country in general. Like, not great. Uh, and to people who say you have to have borders to be a country, okay, yes. That's why open borders is not no borders. You have to have defined areas of sovereignty where your laws are imposed to be a country. But a person being able to freely move across those lines in no way jeopardizes that sovereignty. Like, in no way. Look at Europe, which has open borders and has maintained their sovereignty over various countries for, you know, much longer than we've been around. Look at the policy across our states. Open borders. Like, somebody going from Kentucky to Indiana doesn't take away Indiana's sovereignty or their borders. It, that doesn't actually, I don't think, it, I just think it through a little bit more. Like, that doesn't really wash. Um, you can have borders that are open and still maintain your sovereignty and still maintain your rule of law. Letting people freely travel, seek resources, and work, that doesn't equate to no borders at all. Uh, and an open border policy, by the way, does not even necessarily mean that the people who travel or work here get citizenship. Like, I'm fine on that. Like, I think that that's really a secondary question, right? Like, I think we need to fix our citizenship problem and make it more streamlined and much uh, more much easier to come here legally and, and to become a citizen if that's your goal. But I think a lot of people just want to be able to access food and work a job and see their loved ones. And I think that, you know, we could just have open borders for migration and deal with citizenship as a secondary question. And I think for people who maybe aren't convinced by this whole argument yet, uh, removing citizenship from migration as we were intended to do under the Constitution all along gets rid of some of these questions around like voting and welfare, right? Um, but either way, however we were to work it, I think moving backwards as we did it for most of our history to our open borders type policy would be smart. It had many benefits. We would free up so many resources. The economic growth would be just phenomenal. Um, and I think that we'd really get closer to living up to who we say we are as a people who believe in individual liberty, uh, who truly believe in the American dream and, and who truly want to see more people come here and invest and and really um, throw their weight behind this like crazy notion that we have that we can continue to push back against collectivism and against sort of the way things have always been throughout history until we came along. So I um, am very passionate about immigration. This is a really important issue to me. I hope that this has been informative for you. I hope it maybe um, made you think about things in a different way. I'm going to stop there because I have really pushed my voice to limits on this one. Let me know your questions and thoughts in the comments. Again, as always, my show notes with full links are available at my website, at, uh, which is hannadecox.com. Don't forget, like, subscribe, share, review, all of the things. And until next month, stay based.